Hello! <laughs> In today's video, we're going to create an accountability smart contract and web application. What that means is a user can come to this smart contract, lock up a certain amount of funds, such as Ethereum, into the smart contract for a certain period of time. Each day that they commit to, so you'll commit to a certain number of days, you have to send a message to a specific Discord channel that we've linked up in our application. And if you do succeed and you do commit and you send those messages, messages daily, then you'll be able to withdraw your funds at the end of the commitment period. As you go to withdraw your funds, you'll be awarded with an NFT and you can then use that NFT to mint, uh, sorry, to withdraw the funds from the contract that you originally locked up prior to committing um, for the amount of days that you've committed for. So we're gonna be using all the good stuff, Next.js, TypeScript, Next Auth, the ThirdWeb SDK with some awesome features like signature-based minting, which allows us to mint NFTs based on off-chain criteria and users can use those signatures to mint an NFT and interact with the two smart contracts that we're going to be building out in Solidity. So if you're excited for this video, Hope you enjoy it. Remember, you can access the full source code on my GitHub, which will be linked in the description. Feel free to skim ahead throughout the video. Hopefully I'll add timestamps by you by the time that you watch the video, but I've rambled enough already. Let's get into the coding. All right, so what I kind of have in mind, it's not 100% clear just yet, but the idea is essentially you commit to something and each day you have to kind of prove that you did that thing. And we'll get into how I'm gonna do that in a, in a second here. But you, step one is kind of commit, commit and lock up funds. So you're gonna commit X amount of money to a smart contract. And then two is you're going to prove that you did that thing each day for X days. And at the end of those days, you can come back to the smart contract and say, hey, I either did this thing every day and you're aware of it, or I didn't manage to do it and I can't get my funds back. So you're gonna say, if I did do the thing every day for X days, get my funds back. And if you didn't do it, then I guess you, <laughs> lose your money? I don't know. I haven't really fleshed out the full details here, but that's the plan is you lock up your funds. So you kind of commit to something and the smart contracts holds your funds until the amount of days that you committed for is up. And then it says, okay, uh, at the end, did you do that thing every day by checking? What I have in mind is you lock up your funds. So it's like step one, your money, Let's say this is a smart contract and let's make that a bit bigger. So this is a smart contract. And in the middle here, you're kind of the user. Let's draw a little person over here with two circles. There we go. And this is the user here that says, I'm gonna lock up my money and my money, my monies into the smart contract. So this is going in. So let's make this green as like an input or something. And then the smart contract stores your funds. So it's maybe like a mapping of funds to who uh, sent those funds. So it's like mapping of wallet address to how many, how much they stored in the smart contract or how much they locked up. And once that is locked up, X amount of time has to pass. And what I'm thinking is to prove that you did something, you have to send a message to a Discord server. So it's kind of like you're sending a message to say, I don't know, I did this thing. Or like, for example, if you wanted to commit to going to the gym every day, you could send a picture of you going to the gym or working out or maybe like a screenshot of your Apple Watch working out or something, I don't know, send something to this Discord server. It's gonna be connected to this Discord server over here. It's gonna be in blue. So we have Discord server and the user has to repeatedly kind of send these messages each day. So it's gonna be day one, 
send a message, day two, send a message, day three, however many days they lock up for, they have to send a message to the Discord server. And in our kind of application side of things, what we're gonna do is let's just do a gray box here. I'm gonna say application. Inside of this, you're going to connect your wallet. It's gonna be a connect wallet button. Connect wallet. And then what you'll do is you'll also sign into Discord. Sign in with Discord. And you'll sign in with your Ethereum wallet, which is gonna be this layer here. So it's gonna be connect wallet, sign in with wallet, then sign in with Discord. So you're kind of connecting three pieces of information to prove that you are this wallet and you are this Discord user. And we use the Discord API to say, okay, so once you've connected, it's gonna be this kind of state where you say, all right, you've connected. Then you'll see this button that says, uh, claim funds or check el check uh, claim funds, I guess, and we can check eligibility on the server. So this is gonna be the main button of the application to claim the funds that you're owed. So let's say three days later, you've sent a picture to the Discord server each day, and it says, all right, since you did that, you've committed to X amount of days, then you can claim the funds that you've committed to the smart contract, right? And that's going to hit the smart contract in, in a server. So this is gonna be the server of our application over here, server. So the claim funds is gonna send a request to our server. And what that's gonna do is check eligibility using the Discord API. So it's gonna say, did you send a message for X days? And if you did, then it's gonna interact with the smart contract and say, yep, you did. And withdraw the funds that you uh, locked up into this smart contract here. So it's gonna say, uh, withdraw funds maybe. Yep, and then that's gonna go back to the connected wallet. Let's make that like a dotted line here. So you're gonna withdraw funds to the connected wallet. And that's pretty much the whole application, but I think we can make it a bit cooler to say, maybe you get an NFT or something that proves that you did this specific challenge. So it could be instead of just withdrawing funds, maybe you, maybe you get an NFT generated for you to say, okay, generate an NFT and we're gonna use uh, signature based minting for this. So it'd be bench features, signature-based minting here. And basically an admin can grant you a signature that you can use to mint an NFT. So it's gonna be like generate an NFT or mint, mint an NFT for the user. And you can use that NFT to sort of pass the criteria on the smart contract. So maybe inside of the smart contract, I just realized this is the Discord server. That's not where that belongs. Maybe inside of the smart contract, the withdraw function, the conditions under which you can withdraw is do you own an NFT from the NFT collection? So that's gonna be a separate smart contract to say NFT collection. And it says withdraw function requires you to have an NFT. So it's gonna check, do you have an NFT that got generated in this kind of application environment? And the NFT only gets generated if you pass the criteria of the Discord server. It's gonna say, mint an NFT for the user. So this is gonna request information from the Discord server through the API. It's going to come back here and say, okay, the user passes the checks and we'll mint an NFT for the user, which comes from this smart contract. So it's gonna come from the NFT collection and the user now has an NFT that they can run the withdraw function on the original uh, kind of locking or committing smart contract to say you can now withdraw the funds that you committed if you have that NFT. So I think that's gonna be a bit more interesting and we can use the information of what they committed to say, you know, here's what you achieved inside of that NFT metadata as well. So that's kind of the overall um, 
idea that I have. I'm sure it's going to change quite a bit as we start to build out the actual application as I think it might get a little bit um, complicated. But that's the general idea. I think it's a pretty cool idea to sort of say you're trusting a piece of code here to commit to doing something and you have this kind of daily obligation to prove to a group of people that are maybe like-minded to say, okay, we're all trying to achieve our goals here. We're trying to do something each day and you can share maybe, I don't know, maybe for example, it's like a fitness goal that you have. Maybe there's a channel in the Discord server that's like fitness <clears throat> and you can send your fitness workouts each day into that um, Discord server. That's kind of the idea is that you commit to something bonuses, you might meet like-minded people that are also trying to commit to that same thing. And there's no kind of trust involved in locking up your money. It's all within the code that's going to be open source and you can commit knowing that this code is going to be what's executing behind the scenes. And the kind of signature-based minting of NFTs is a little bit of a fun aspect where you get an NFT as a reward, which you can then kind of utilize in the original smart contract to say, okay, you own this NFT, I guess, that um, allows you to withdraw the funds that you committed that you achieved your goal. Um, so yeah, let's jump into the code. Ideas in mind of like resources of how we can accomplish this. The first one is the signature-based minting, which we'll get into as we build out the application. But we're going to be using ThirdWeb's base contracts. So let's go to the contract kit here. We'll go to base contracts. We'll go to ESC721 signature mint. So let's open that up. And there's also a solidity kind of by example, I believe it is a solidity by example lock contract. And this actually might even be the hard hat default contract. So let's go hard hat get started. Getting started with hard hat. And I believe, yeah, the lock contract is the getting started smart contract here. So we're going to say, Lock, unlock time, owner, withdrawal. And there's a bunch of things happening here I don't really understand, but um, <laughs> yeah, we can use this. Uh, this is just off the memory of what I've been kind of learning along the past couple of months about building smart contracts. And we'll get into um, building a smart contract out in our project. The first thing we're going to do is let's open up the CLI here and we're going to change directory into uh, just this project here. Let's make a new project called accountability. If I can spell it accountability, let's change directory into it and let's open this up in VS code here. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to create the actual smart contract. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a repository inside of this. So if we go to the portal, go to CLI, we can run this npx the web latest create command. And what this is gonna do is create a project for us. And the first thing it's gonna ask us if we wanna create an app or a uh, contracts project. For us, it's gonna be contracts. I'm gonna name this the contracts repository. <clears throat> let's select hard hat for the framework and let's just select an empty contract to begin with. So this first contract that we're going to build is going to be the actual accountability smart contract. Just need a sip of water here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, what we're gonna do is we're first going to create a smart contract that looks something like this lock contract where you commit funds for a certain period of time. So let's just quickly take a look at what this is actually doing. So we have a contract called lock. We have an unlock time, we have an owner, we have Unlock time should be in the future for the constructor, unlock time, blah, blah, blah. And what this is gonna do is emit an event and transfer, transfer from the owner What? I guess it, you lock it up for a certain amount of time and when that time is reached, then you can withdraw the funds is what it looks like to me. It's kind of confusing this, <laughs> this line here is just really confusing to me, but I'm pretty sure that's what it's doing. So you lock up funds for a certain period of time and we're going to use a kind of 
modification of this where we we can only withdraw funds if you own an NFT from this NFT collection. So we're gonna create two smart contracts. And if we go into our contracts repository that just got created for us, let's open it up. You can now see we have contracts and the contract on sold, which is just a basic empty contract. Let's just open up the terminal as well and I'll zoom in for you so you can see what is going on. Um, there we go, a little bit laggy, but we're good. And that's going to be our, let's call it contract accountability. And the role of this smart contract is to lock up funds for a period of time. Users can only withdraw funds if they own an NFT from another smart contract. And we're gonna create another contract called NFT collection.sol, let's say, just keep it simple. And what we're gonna do for this one is we're going to use this ERC721 signature mint base contract. I think we might actually use ERC. Uh, which one do we want? This is a good question here. I think let's do ERC721 signature mint, right? And if we go to the implementing the contract section, we copy and paste this in to our NFT collection .sol. Let's match up the 0.8.9. Yeah, let's use 0.8.9. And this smart contract is an NFT collection with signature-based minting enabled. And if you don't know what that is, if we go to the documentation here, <clears throat> you can see signature-based minting or on-demand minting allows the admin wallet to generate signatures that allow other users to mint tokens on your smart contract. So essentially you create a signature that has very specific information about the NFT, about who can mint that NFT, when they can mint the NFT, and the user can utilize that signature to actually mint an NFT into your smart contract under the conditions that you outlined in that signature. So they can only mint an NFT into your smart contract if it follows the information that you've defined from that signature. So for example, you could say here's an NFT that has a picture of a dog and <laughs> the user can only mint that NFT into your smart contract if it follows the exact metadata of the dog that you specified. So it's a pretty stupid example, but what we're gonna use it for is we're going to generate signatures for NFTs to mint into the smart contract. And then if you have a generated signature that you've used to mint, you can then withdraw your funds. So we're only going to generate the NFTs if you meet the criteria of that Discord check where you send a message in the Discord channel um, for a certain number of days in a row is essentially what we're going to be using this NFT smart contract for. So if we go to the um, contract kit, again, we'll go to this base contract page. You can see we have all of the standard features of the ERC721 standard, which is the non-fungible token standard. And we also have signature minting, EIP 712, blah, 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 blah. It's pretty much just what I described. So it's a basic NFT contract that you can mint NFTs into. And you also have this bonus kind of feature of signature-based minting. So it has all of the features you would expect of an NFT contract, like the ESC721 standard, you can mint NFTs, you can batch mint NFTs, the contract itself has metadata, the contract can be owned by a specific address, it has royalties and the funds of uh, the NFTs, this is a little hard to describe, <laughs> the funds, you can use primary sale. So you can tell in the signature that you can only mint it if you pay, I don't know, 0.1 ETH inside of the actual signature. And that's why it has primary sales. So any funds that are used from the signature go to this primary sale wallet address, which allows you to specify who or what wallet address receives all of the funds for primary sales of NFTs. It's kind of not what we're going to be using in this contract, so it's not that relevant. Um, and I'm just gonna leave it at that because I, <laughs> I don't think I explained it that well. But essentially inside of the signature, you can specify a price and any funds from minting those signatures where you have to pay a price can go to this primary sale. So that's just all of the features that are available in this base contract here. <clears throat> and by saying, sorry, my 
voice is still recovering. <clears throat> we're saying we're importing the ESC 729 signature mint contract here. And we're saying our contract, let's say NFT collection, well, let's say accountability NFTs is ESC 721 signature mint. And our smart contract here, the accountability NFTs inherits all of the behavior of the ESC 721 signature mint here. And to kind of showcase that, if we go to the terminal, we can run NPX, we can actually just run yarn build. And what this is gonna do is build our smart contract using the detect command, which is actually um, <laughs> outdated. It's just build now, but it's going to be yarn build and that under the hood runs MPX the latest build. And this is going to run on all of our smart contracts and show us the features that we've unlocked of the um, third web contract kit. So you can see in our accountability NFTs, we've inherited all of the logic or these features of the ERC721 signature mint contract that we've inherited. So we have ERC721. And what this actually means is if you go to the SDK, <clears throat> we'll go to ERC721, we'll go to standard, we then unlock all of these features inside of our smart contract. So we can use view NFT balance, view NFT metadata, transfer NFTs. And since we have mintable and batch mintable, we got all of these features like mint unique NFTs, batch mint NFTs, view, blah, 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 blah. Pretty much all of these extensions map to something that you unlock inside of the SDK. So we're gonna be using that inside of our application where users can kind of connect their wallet, sign in, sign in with Discord, and then check uh, the eligibility we can use all of these features of our smart contract inside of the SDK that we're going to be building out later. All right, so that's that. I don't actually think we need to even change anything <clears throat> in this um, accountability NFT smart contract. It's pretty stock standard. We are going to be using signatures to mint NFTs to specific users. What we do need to do in our accountability smart contract is define in the constructor, we're going to say define the NFT contract address, and this is gonna be passed in as a parameter. So we're gonna say here, we're going to let the smart contract know which NFT collection to check. And that's, yep. And that's gonna be address NFT collection address, and we can change <clears throat> address. I'm really sorry for my voice. We can change, let's rename this file, accountability NFTs. We can import this contract here. So we're gonna say import, uh, that goes above the, nope, below. Imports the smart contract that we just defined. So it's gonna be dot slash accountability. Uh, that should be it, right? Accountability NFTs dot sol. Um, yes, looks good, cool. So we're gonna import that smart contract. We're gonna type it as that. So we're gonna say accountability NFTs. Um, NFT collection address, and then we can then access all of the expected functionality that we have in this other smart contract here, since we've typed it as that smart contract. So we're gonna say essentially, uh, when you deploy the smart contract, you have to pass in an accountability NFT. So we're gonna first deploy this ERC721 signature mint NFT collection, and we're going to then secondly, deploy this accountability smart contract and pass in the first NFT smart contract that we've just deployed into the constructor and say, okay, now we can access all of the functionality of this deployed smart contract inside of this one. And you can see if we go NFT collection address dot, we then have all of the functionality like mint, for example, or balance of is the one I'm really interested in. So we can see balance of, and we can check to see if a specific wallet address owns an NFT from this smart contract here. So before we do that, let's first grab a variable to say, uh, store the NFT collection smart contract in this variable. And that's going to store the actual smart contract. So now when we deploy the contract inside of the constructor, we're first going to provide, I'm not sure what my pretty is, not happy here, but that's all right. Um, when we deploy the smart contract, we're going to pass in the NFT collection address of the accountability NFTs contract that we've deployed. We're going to set the accountability NFTs inside of this smart contract as the address of the smart contract that we deployed. So we can now access this smart contract inside of this variable here called accountability NFTs. 
And now I think we just need to think about what this smart contract actually does. I think there's a few operations that it needs to perform. So the first thing we need to implement is one, store um, the amount of, yes, the amount of ETH each address has deposited and it doesn't necessarily have to be ETH whether we deployed on Polygon or any other EVM compatible chain, but we're going to store the amount of ETH. For example, each address has deposited in this smart contract. Yep, that looks good. And we need a mapping to do that. So we're gonna say this will go inside of a mapping this will go inside, maybe there's dot points here. This will go inside of a mapping that maps address to a uint. That sounds good to me. <clears throat> and the second thing we need to do is withdraw function that checks if the user owns an NFT from the other smart contract. If they do, if they do, then send them the ETH back. If they don't, then revert the transaction. That sounds good, right? And I think that's literally all we actually need to do. Um, maybe a function that helps you view why you, I don't know, I think that's fine. And maybe we have a, um, a function, function that, function that checks when the user can call the withdraw function. And this is gonna be based on, based on the amount of time they have deposited the ETH for. All right, and we need another mapping that's kind of, we need another mapping that stores when each user deposited their ETH and, and for how long they want to lock it up. Yep, that sounds good. And I think that's pretty much it, right? We just have this kind of ability to send funds in, take funds out, and maybe view the kind of state of the smart contract. So for this, I think what we need to do is we'll have a mapping that maps a wallet address to a struct. So we're gonna create a struct that stores <clears throat> um, what do we need? We need the amount they staked, how long they staked it for, and when they staked. So it's gonna be, well, the, the wallet address is the key. And the second thing, the amount of funds locked up, the time the funds were locked up for, and when, when the user um, locked the funds up. Uh, that's pretty much all we need. So it's gonna be struct locked funds, if Copilot is suggesting the right stuff here, amounts, time, and locked at. So this is gonna be the mapping that we have beneath this is the wallet address is the key that maps to a locked funds struct. So this is gonna be mapping, um, not really sure of the syntax here. I think it's gonna be mapping of address to locked funds, public locked funds. And then we store, I think this should be a bit higher up personally, store the NFT collection smart contract in this variable and the constructor is only really concerned with that. So I'm gonna move that up here as well. I don't really like this uh, formatting. So let's maybe just make it like that. <clears throat> so this section is concerned with setting the NFT smart contract to check, and then we can move into the locked funds. So let's get rid of that. Now maybe let's move these comments out down here. So the amount of funds locked up, the time the funds were locked up for, the amount of time the funds are, whoops, funds are locked up for, and thirdly, when the user locked them up. So there's gonna be a timestamp when they locked them up, the amount of time they locked up for, and the amount they locked up. So that's gonna be this struct locked funds. We then have a mapping of the wallet address to the locked funds struct. Excellent, all right. So then we need a function that withdraws. So there's gonna be function withdraw. Let's see what Copilot comes up with here. This is, 
lock funds public payable require that the amount of ETH is equal to the amount of ETH in the smart contract. <clears throat> I don't think that's quite um, <laughs> what I wanted. Let's write this a little bit ourselves. So we're going to say lock funds and the amount and time are the two parameters. So we're going to say UN256 amount and whoops, UN256 time. And it's going to be public payable. I think payable just means we can send funds to this function. And what we're going to do in this function is all we really want to do is one, transfer the amount of funds to the smart contract. E Maybe I don't need this amount if it comes as the thing, yes? Yeah? So, and then update the mappings. That looks good. Um, I think there's a few checks that we want to make here. So we're going to say first check to see if the user has already locked up funds. So I say require lock funds messages that send that amount equals zero. That's an interesting one because if they're not in the mapping at all, I think amount will be zero. That's an interesting one. I'm not actually 100% sure of this, but we can maybe write some tests to check that and then transfer the amount of funds to the smart contract. So it's gonna be message.sender. If it's payable, I'm actually not really sure how that works. So maybe let's look that up. Payable solidity. Cool, solidity by example. So functions and address declared payable can receive ether. Whoops. And what we're doing here is we have deposits, a function to deposit ether into the smart contract, call this function along with some ether, the balance of this contract will be automatically updated, not payable public, call this function along with some ether, the function will throw an error since this is not payable, function to withdraw all ether from this contract. This stop balance. Owner can receive ether since the address of owner is payable. Okay, so maybe this mapping. I think it's fine. What's this call value amounts? That's really confusing. Um, okay. So transfer the amount of funds to the smart contract. So the deposit actually just does nothing. That's really interesting. Okay. Um, transfer the amount of funds to the smart contract and in the deposit, sorry, I'm zooming in, you probably can't see anything they actually don't do anything, which is really interesting. Maybe we don't even need to write any transfer logic. What we do need to do is update the mappings. So we're gonna say locked funds message dot sender is equal to locked funds message dot value. So the first thing we want is in the struct, we have amount, then we have some message dot value. That looks correct. The time is equal to time that the user passed in as a parameter and the locked at is equal to the current time. That looks correct. Excellent. All right. And if that's really all we need to do, since this is payable, I believe that's all we really need. Um, all right. So let's get rid of these comments. So we have lock funds. Public payable, first check to see if the user has already locked up funds. Let's just get rid of that comment, it's pretty self-explanatory. Update the lock funds mapping with a new amount of ETH. That looks really good. All right, so second, we need to withdraw funds. So we're gonna say function withdraw, or with, yeah, we can call it with, withdraw. And the, 
withdraw function checks the conditions and sends money back. So what do we have in this suggestion here? We have a require that you have more than zero locked funds. We require that the current timestamp is greater than or equal to locked at, which isn't quite correct. We have the balance of, all right, so let's accept this suggestion and we're gonna say, you have no lock funds, that's fine. This second check here says block.timestamp is greater than or equal to locked funds message.sender locked at plus the amount of time. That's correct. Then we check the balance of the NFT collection is greater than zero. You do not own an NFT from the other smart contract. Payable message sender. So we're wrapping the message.sender in a payable and we're transferring the amount that they're owed and we set locked funds amount is equal to zero. Now, there's a note here about re-entrancy, but I don't really know what I'm talking about here. So we, we're gonna say note, let's learn about re-entrancy and see if this is safe. All right, so we're gonna come back to that and let's get rid of this function here. The third thing we wrote down as a little note was function that checks when the user can call the withdraw function again I don't think that's necessary since we have the mapping. Excellent. All right, so that's pretty much all we need. Um, one thing I do want to learn about is re-entrancy attacks because if we look this up, right? Re-entrancy attacks, solidity, hack, solidity, re-entrancy attack. So let's take a look at this. Solidity by example, re-entrancy vulnerability. Let's say that contract A calls contract B. Re-entrancy exploit allows B to call back into A before A finishes execution. What I'm worried about is this line 38 running, but line 39 doesn't run, meaning the user could come in and run line 38 and then exit out rerun withdraw and their uh, lock funds amount is not reset to zero. So they just continuously withdraw and withdraw and withdraw and withdraw without the amount owed ever being reset. If we take a look at this, it says re-entrancy exploit allows B to call back into A before A finishes execution. So let's take a look at this smart contract. Ether store is a contract where you can deposit and withdraw ETH. This contract is vulnerable to re the attack, which sounds pretty similar to what we're doing. Uh, deploy Ether store, deposit one ETH each from account one and account two, deploy attack with address of Ether store, call attack dot attack sending one ETH using account three you will get three ETH back, two ETH stolen from Alice and Bob plus one ETH. What happened? Attack was able to call ETH store withdraw multiple times before ETH. Blah, 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 blah. Here's how the functions were called. ETH, this, uh, sorry, attack, attack, ETH store dot deposit, ETH store dot withdraw, attack fallback, ETH store dot withdraw, attack fallback. Okay. So in this example, they have Etherstore smart contract has a mapping, which is very similar to ours, a wallet address to Uint, public balances. It has a deposit function where you can pay, which I actually think we need to do. Oh, we've already done that. Okay, so we're doing the exact same thing. We have a deposit payable and we have a withdrawal that says balance, require balance is greater than zero, which is what we're doing. So require balance is greater than zero. Bool sent is equal to message.sender.call value bal holy moly, okay. Um, yep. And then we have balance resetting it back to zero. All right. And the attack contract stores an ether store contract. Fallback is called when ether store sends ether to this contract. Okay. Yeah, so I'm pretty sure we're vulnerable to this. I'm not 
one hundred percent sure we're since we're not doing this, I think we might be okay. This fallback might not get called. I'm not actually sure, but the way that we do it is re-entrancy guard. Ensure all state changes happen before calling external contracts. Use function modifiers that prevent re-entrancy. Okay, so let's take a look at re-entrancy guard. Re-entrancy guard. Security open Zeppelin. And here we have re-entrancy guard. Contract module that prevents re-entrant calls to a function. Inheriting from re-entrancy guard will make the non-re-entrant modifier available, which can be applied to functions to make sure there are no nested re-entrant calls to them. Note that because there is a single non-reentrant guard, functions marked as non-reentrant may not call one another. This can be worked around by making those functions private and then adding external non-reentrants, blah, 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 blah. Prevents a con contract from calling itself directly or indirectly. Calling a non-reentrant function from another non-reentrant function is not supported. It is possible to prevent this from happening by making, you know, same shit I just read. All right, so I think this is what we want. If you would like to learn more about reentrancy and alternative ways to protect against it, check out reentrancy after Istanbul. All right, this looks like it's gonna be complicated, but let's take a look. What is reentrancy? We just read about that. The in... Um, the invariant here is that amounts of funds in the contract is equal to the sum of all entries during the execution of call in the third line. The invariant is broken. This one. Because amount funds have been transferred out of balances but hasn't been updated yet, the very same call allows re-entrancy because message.sender can be a contract. If an attack triggered re-entrancy at this point, this will be able to profit, yep. We'll now see several ways to defend against these attra attacks. The first technique that we should know is checks effect interaction pattern. It describes a way of organizing the statements in a function such that a contract state is left in a consistent state. What the hell was that sentence? This is done by classifying every statement as either a check and effect, a state, whatever. Let's move on. If at any point of execution we are unsure whether our contract's invariants hold or not, we should avoid calling other untrusted contracts because they could re-enter. If we have no choice but to do so, we can try to prevent re-entrancy attacks by using a re-entrancy guard. A re-entrancy guard is a piece of code that causes execution to fail when re-entrancy is detected. There is implementation of this pattern in open Zeppelin contracts called a re-entrancy guard, which provides a non-re-entrant modifier. Applying this modifier to a function will render it non-re-entrant attempts to re-enter. What happens when our contract has multiple functions, since the modifier is applied per function if we want to completely prevent whatever. I think this is the solution if we decide to make every function. Okay, so maybe let's install this. First thing we need to do is npm install add opens up and slash contracts. So let's go ahead and add that. And then if we take a look at reentrancy guard, how do we actually import it here? Um, alrighty. Let's just ask Copilot to do it. Let's say reentrancy. Yeah. Yep, that's what I wanted. So import reentrancy guard. And then let's say our contract is reentrancy guard. Contract accountability is reentrancy guard. Then let's say public non reentrant, public payable. I don't really know if this needs to be non reentrant. I don't think it does, but let's just add it anyway. Non reentrant. Excellent. All right. And then that should prevent our function here from being re entered. And then this is kind of. 
more safe from re-entrancy attacks because if we've detected that we've re-entered this function, we can then say, okay, this is something, something fishy is going on. Let's not do whatever we're about to do. So let's go ahead and yarn build this just to make sure it compiles. And then maybe let's move on to writing some tests. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say hard hat tests, testing contracts, writing tests, create a new directory called tests inside a project root directory and create a new file in that called token. Let's say new folder test. Um, we'll explain it, but let's write a test for contract.sol. We don't really need to test this because we haven't changed any logic from the base contract. So in theory, it's pretty much safe as is. We're going to test the contract here. So we're gonna say const expect, this shouldn't be sol, I'm sorry, this should be JS. Let's change this to dot test dot js just to make it clearer. We're going to require chai and let's see if we open up the terminal here. If we run mpx hard hats test, does it actually do anything? No, we don't have chai installed. So let's say npm install chai and mpx hard hat test. Okay, all right, so now we can run tests. So we're gonna describe contract.sol. It, deployment should assign the total supply of tokens to the owner. Deployment should assign the total supply of tokens to the owner. I don't really know what I'm reading. Let's just get rid of it. The things that we wanna test are, you should be able to, basically do the flow that you would expect. Um, so should reject, should be able to uh, deploy the contract, should be able to deposit funds into the contract using the lock funds function, should reject a, um, withdrawal, if the user doesn't have enough funds, that's not true. She doesn't have an NFT from the contract. Should reject a withdrawal if the user doesn't have enough funds. If the user has zero funds. And then maybe let's try replicate some kind of re-entrancy attack. Uh, there's a thing in this hot hat test where you have kind of um, before all or something like that, running common steps with fixtures. This is what I want, load fixtures. And this looks like it needs an import, so nomic foundation. All right, let's go ahead and import that. Then what we're doing is AC function deploy token fixture. So this code can pretty much run before everything. So what we wanna do in the fixture is deploy contracts fixture. What we wanna do is get contract factory of accountability NFTs. Then let's rename that accountability NFTs factory. We're gonna copy and paste that. We're gonna say contract this should be renamed to accountability. Accountability NFTs and accountability. Accountability factory is equal to await ethers contract token and get rid of that. So we now have accountability um, and accountability and NFTs factory. What we want to do is say accountability. NFT is equal to accountability NFTs factory dot deploy. We're gonna copy and paste this. And instead of NFTs, we're going to say accountability. So now we've deployed, whoops, what have I done? We've deployed the accountability contract and then we deploy accountability NFTs. We actually need to do NFTs first and then for accountability, we pass in the accountability NFTs contract address, which I have no idea how to get. So let's see what happens. Uh, console.log 
uh, accountability NFTs deployed to accountability NFTs dot address is probably what I'm looking for. So we pass in the address of the NFT contract into the constructor of the uh, accountability factory. And then, okay, so we await it to be deployed first. Let's say await accountability NFTs is deployed. Let's also await accountability is deployed as well. And let's say console log that down here. So console log accountability deployed. Fixtures can be returned, anything you consider useful for your tests. So let's return um, accountability. Let's return accountability NFTs. Let's return owner address and address two. Excellent. All right. And then we can reuse this kind of thing inside of our test. So let's say it should be able to, we don't really need that as we're already doing that in the fixture. So it should be able to deposit funds into the contract using the lock funds function. So it should be able to deposit funds using the lock funds function. Um, yes, I want to load the fixture and deploy contracts fixture. Yes. Then what I want to do is actually lock the funds, send the value. Expect accountability. That's not a real thing. Let's just run this and see what happens. See if it even compiles. Excellent. All right. So if we go to our CLI, let's ignore that. And we're going to run MPX hard hat test. Ethers is not defined. Where do I even? Uh, okay. Ethers is not defined. Ethers. Huh. Alrighty. Apparently it's not. Uh, cannot read properties of undefined reading get contract factory. So ethers, I th don't think we have hard hat installed. Which is the problem here. Yeah? We do have hard hat installed. All right. Uh, what's happening here? Ethers don't get contract factory. What is happening here? Um, what is happening? Um, ethers. What the? You know, test we're going to use ethers. Ethers are able to in global scope. You'd like to always be implicit. Yeah. Using a different account. What am I doing wrong here? Can I read properties of undefined? We didn't get contract factory. This is strange. Um, on test, not really sure why it's not happy with us here. Cannot read properties of undefined. Let's see. A contract factory when testing contract required nomic labs at hard hat waffle. Const HRE equals require hard hat. Okay, let's try that one. HRE. Um, let's say ethers is require hard hat. Ethers don't get contract factory is not a function, require this. What is going on here? Okay, cannot find module. npm install this. Um, I think we're probably missing something from the hard hat project that they have set up here. My goodness, how do I create the project? npm init, npm install hard hat, npx hard hat. So maybe let's do that 
if this doesn't work. Yeah, so let's run npx hot add test. Okay, we're missing something. Oh, I didn't install yet. Let's try again. Okay, well, let's switch context here. CD uh, dev, and let's create a new hard hat project, see what it does. npx hard hat, create a JavaScript project. Hard hat project root, C dev hard hat test. Do you want to git ignore? Sure. Hard hat test. Let's run it again. C dev hard hat test. Yes. Okay. CD into that project. See what we have. Yana dev a million things. And let's do that. So Yana had all of these things. And we're going to say npm install dash dash dev, all of that good stuff. And let's also do the same thing. Yana dev into this project here. Hard hat config doesn't have anything funky. We have require hard hat toolbox in the config. So let's add that. Hi, Anomic Toolbox, whatever. And just setting up the test, we have lock, require all of these things. Time, load fixture. I'm assuming I'm gonna need all of this. Let's copy and paste that into our project. Time, we'll also need expect from chai. And that's all they have, so. Now, if we run this, we could say npm run test. This should work. Nope. Okay, missing argument in contract constructor. So that is this one. So at least our test is running now. So we need to deploy accountability NFT factory dot deploy. And this is gonna be the, let's get rid of this. Accountability NFTs factory. So the NFTs contract actually has a constructor. If we go into this, we need name, symbol, royalty recipient. So let's say in our test, where's it gone? Deploy, so name, let's say accountability NFTs, symbol. The next thing we need is the royalty recipient address, which you can say is owner dot address. Royalty BPS is just gonna be zero. And the primary series recipient can also be owner.address. And it's complaining, it needs a comma. All right, so then if we rerun it, should be able to, the MPX hard hat test, you have both Ethereum waffle and, okay, let's uninstall Ethereum waffle. So let's go to our thing here, just installed a bunch of random crap, waffle. Oh my god, that was lawful. So let's run yarn npm install. Whoops. Okay. All right, so let's see if we run mpx hard hat test here. We should just run the test nice and smooth. Okay, excellent. So big number value passed to the lock funds function. Value 1000. Okay, invalid big number value, argument value, value 1000. Sweet, okay, so value 1000, lock funds. Uh, does this need to be a big number? Big number, don't have it, ethers dot big number dot from 1000. Let's try that out. Invalid big number value. Okay, so let's say call the lock funds function. Uh, let's look this up. So we have accountability, small contract. We wanna pass in um, a time. I don't actually think we were doing that. So lock funds needs one parameter, which is time. This is gonna be add 10 seconds to the current timestamp. Yep, that looks good. 
time.latest and we imported time from this random package. I don't really know what's happening here, but let's see if this actually works. So we're now passing the parameter as well as a value and intermediate value dot add. Huh. Okay. So let's say const time now time.latest const time now plus one week. I don't really know what the syntax is or what the hell I'm doing, uh, but let's pass in time now plus one week into this. Let's pass that in and run the test again. Time now dot add is not a function. What is happening here? Dot. So this is gonna be, what is time now? A number. Time now plus time dot increase the time dot duration dot minutes one. Okay, so let's add those two together and let's pass that in. So it's gonna be time now plus one minute pass that in as the time they want to, oh, wait, how is this function structured? So it's time, so amount time, and the time you pass in is, oh, so this should just be one minute. It shouldn't even add to the current timestamp. Um, so it should be just time.duration.minutes1. So let's just pass that in here and say you pass in one minute is the time that you want. So it's gonna be, I actually don't know what this does, but we'll see. Okay, so that successfully passed. It doesn't mean anything because we didn't expect any value, but the function was successfully called. So we can say now, let's check the mapping called um, locked funds. Yes, to see if the funds were deposited. Let's close this off. Funds locked funds equals await accountability lock funds owner dot address. And I'm assuming let's call this from owner. So we're saying call this function from owner wallet. And I believe we can connect to accountability. So we're gonna say accountability dot connect owner dot lock funds. So we're gonna await this. And then we'll say lock funds accountability lock funds owner dot address. Lock funds should be equal to the amount of funds deposited. Expect locked funds um, to equal, that's not gonna happen. It's gonna be locked funds dot amount. Let's zoom out a little bit here. Lock funds dot amount should be that. Lock funds dot time to equal. Um, honestly, don't know. 60? Like 60? And then expect locked funds dot, what's the final thing? Locked at to equal. Huh. Yeah, sure. Let's try that. Let's see if there's actually runs. It's going to tell us what the actual values are. We can kind of use that to our advantage. So it's going to say intermediate value dot two number. What the hell is happening? All right, let's get rid of that. Intermediate value dot two number. Okay, so the funds for this user are 1000 and the time is 60. So then the final thing we need is locked at should be um, the current timestamp, I guess. It's going to be block time dot latest block latest what does that do return the timestamp of the latest block that looks good might be off by like one the input value cannot be normalized to a big int value blah is of the type object but it is not an instance of the one known by big number types uh so this needs to be awaited it's gonna be a wait Time latest. Okay, let's try this out. 
All right, nice. So all of the data that we expect is set when we deposit the fund. So we're depositing a thousand or like a thousand way or a thousand ETH. I'm not actually sure, but it works. The mapping is being updated. So we're saying when we deposit 1000 as the lock funds function, it's being stored inside of this lock funds uh, mapping down here, sorry. Under the key of the wallet address, we can then say the amount is 1000, the time is 60 because we deposited it for one minute and lock funds is equal to the latest timestamp. So now what we're gonna test is we will try and withdraw the funds, but it shouldn't work because they don't own an NFT from the um, accountability NFTs collection here. So if we call the, uh, it should reject a withdrawal if the user doesn't have any contract, an NFT from the contract. Um, essentially, all we need to do is grab the fixture again and await accountability.connect, connect to the contract with the owner, uh, lock the funds, yep. So we'll do the lock, we'll do the same lock and lock it up and then we'll try and withdraw. So lock funds, let's say try and withdraw funds after, uh, well, let's let's say should project a withdrawal if the time hasn't passed yet. If the time hasn't passed yet. So let's move this comment down here. We'll do that next. So we're gonna say if the time hasn't passed yet, await expect accountability Draw funds to be reverted with. You can't withdraw funds yet. And let's just double check the contract to see. You cannot withdraw yet is the message. So to be reverted with, you cannot withdraw yet. So if the time hasn't passed yet, so let's run this test. And withdraw funds is not a function. It's just called withdraw. Excellent, all right, so that fails as we expect. So let's close these off and then should reject if the user doesn't have an NFT from the contract yet. So then we're gonna lock up the funds. We're going to wait uh, one minute. Cool, that looks good. And then try and withdraw the funds, withdraw. So let's not expect it to be reverted. So let's say await successfully withdraw funds. Await accountability owner withdraw. Um, expect the funds to be withdrawn. Yep, and then expect my balance to be 1000. Let's see if this works. MPX hard hard test these two. You do not own, oh, okay. So this should fail. Um, these should be moved to the test we want to be successful. So this should actually fail. Fail because we don't have an NFT. So this should be withdraw. Um, let's say expect accountability Expect accountability withdraw to be reverted with. And the message is, you did not own an NFT from the other smart contract. Cool, all right, so this should now fail and pass our test. Excellent, and should reject a withdrawal if the user has zero funds. So let's copy this one. So you shouldn't be able to reject I mean, sorry, you shouldn't be able to uh, withdraw anything if you don't have any funds. So that will hit here, you have no locked funds. So you don't deposit anything first and then you try and withdraw and it should fail with you have no locked funds. Sweet. And then let's say successfully um, withdraw funds if you have an NFT and the time has passed. So with this, we actually need to mint an NFT to the 
address that's calling this. So let's say uh, first, oh, let's write this it thing, blah, 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 blah. Let's grab the fixture. And first we need to mint an NFT to the owner. So let's say wait accountability NFTs dot connect dot mint. Hmm, I wish we had some kind of type here, but I don't think we do. Uh, so let's go to our NFTs and there should be ESC 720 on base. There should be a mint function in here. Mint, 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 mint two accepts a address and a token URI. So let's say in our test, we're gonna mint, what was it? Mint, uh, mint two, mint two, the address and the URI. Let's just put the dummy URI here. So the NFT gets minted to the owner and now we can lock funds. So let's actually lock the funds first. So let's copy this one. We'll lock funds again. Let's close this test off. And so we're locking the funds. We have an NFT minted to us. Now we should successfully withdraw funds, withdraw. And I think I copied this, so um, maybe I didn't, this one, nope, okay. So then let's expect uh, the balance of the owner to be 1000 and expect the lock funds mapping to have zero funds. Yes, looks good. All right, let's test it out. So we lock our funds, we have an NFT minted to us and then we should be able to do successfully withdraw. Okay, so we can't withdraw when the time hasn't passed. We need to actually um, pass time, increase the time by one minute. And then we should be able to do it here. Okay, so the balance uh, is nine, nine, blah, 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 blah. Hmm, okay, so let's say grab the balance before, um, grab wallet balance. And then we lock the funds, we connect, we mint, pass the time. The balance should, it won't be the same, uh, but it should give us an idea of what's happening here. So expect balance to equal this, big number from wallet balance. Hopefully this looks a bit closer. Yes, so minus the gas prices. Um, can we do that? Minus gas prices? Hmm, maybe not. Okay. Um, how do we want to do this? So expected this to equal this, but these are the gas prices, so it's kind of difficult. Um, maybe we can grab the gas costs from this. I think this might be a bit overkill. We can maybe just get rid of it, but let's see what we can do. Uh, withdraw, so that's gonna be const transaction two. That's actually transaction three. Const transaction two. And then we can say, minus the cost of the transactions. So dot sub transaction one is any, that's annoying. Um, gas limit multiplied by gas price. Let's see if this works. So we're, multi we're subtracting the gas price of the three transactions here. Let's see if this works. If it doesn't, I'm happy to just get rid of it. Um, okay, let's just get rid of this one. Cool, and then let's get rid of these unnecessary things here. All right, sweet. So if we MPX hard hat test here, we're looking good. Excellent. All right, so we have five tests that are passing. Let's come back to that re-entrancy later if we have time. Um, excellent, all right, so now we have all these tests. We're happy with the logic of our smart contract. We're ready to go ahead and deploy it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna run Yarn Deploy or npm run deploy. And under the hood, 
You can see here, this is just running npx the web latest deploy, which is the CLI. It's detecting our project type, compiling it. Let's compile both of them. And it's gonna deploy the ABIs uh, and upload those ABIs to IPFS. So you can see in the artifacts here, you can go to contracts. The ABIs are being built out here. So we have the ABI for accountability. We have the ABI for accountability NFTs being built out. These are going to be uploaded uh, as files to IPFS. And then it's going to print out a link for us where we can deploy these smart contracts. Um, so let's close this hard hat test thing that we did before. Let's just wait for this link to be printed out. What I'll do is just preemptively load up the dashboard here and connect my wallet. Go ahead and connect my MetaMask wallet here. Excellent, all right, and now we have this deploy link. I'm just gonna open it up twice and we'll deploy the accountability NFTs contract first. Let's give this a name. Let's just call it accountability NFTs. Symbol is just gonna be ACCT, royalty recipient. Um, so this is just the name of the smart contract, the symbol or the ticker of each of the tokens, the wallet address that receives royalties, the amount of royalties. If you wanted 5%, you could have 500 here. If you wanted 10%, you could have uh, 1,000 here. I'm just gonna do zero. As I don't really care, I'm gonna put it on a testnet anyway. I'm just using my wallet address for the wallet address that receives the royalties and the primary sales. And I'm gonna deploy this to the Goeli testnet. Sweet, go ahead and confirm that transaction here. And once that's deployed, we can go back to this page to deploy our accountability smart contract. And when this transaction goes through, we'll get the contract address of the accountability NFTs and we were able to use that as the constructor parameter for the NFT collection address field here. So once this transaction goes through, we will be able to deploy our next smart contract as well. Taking a little bit of time, but it's okay. It's taking a long time. All right, while that's happening in the background, what I'm gonna do is we're gonna stay in the same accountability directory, but we're gonna split up the project into contracts and we're gonna have an application folder as well. All right, sweet, so that's deployed. And once this page has been deployed, we can copy the contract address for the NFTs, paste it in here as the NFT collection address for the accountability smart contract, and we'll deploy this smart contract now. So while that's happening in the background, we're going to run a command called npx the web create. And this time, instead of contract, we're gonna use the dash dash app flag. And that's just gonna answer the first question for us where it said, do you want a contract or do you want an app? I'm just gonna call this folder application. And for the project, I'm gonna be using Next.js and TypeScript. You can choose uh, whatever language you want. We are gonna be using the Next.js API route, so I would suggest if you're following along, then we'll use Next.js. Uh, so cool. Looks like we deployed the accountability smart contract and the um, NFT collection smart contract in the background here. So in the accountability NFTs, this is actually an ERC721 uh, NFT collection smart contract and the accountability is um, the accountability smart contract that we wrote in the kind of solidity environment that we set up here um, where we're testing accountability.sol and accountability NFTs is the NFT collection. So pretty self-explanatory. Um, the first thing we're gonna do is set ourselves up a little bit here in the application folder. So this is the folder that we've just created. It's still running in the background, but you can see it's just installing the dependencies for now. Uh, what we can do is we'll open up the terminal, we'll change directory into application. We'll, uh, we don't have to do that. We can just open the terminal up in application. What we're gonna do is within the application, we're gonna create a new folder called const, create a new file called contract addresses.ts. And from here, we're gonna export the contract addresses that we deployed. So accountability and accountability NFTs. So I'm gonna say export const, const accountability contract address, it's equal to empty string, I can't remember what it was, and export const um, accountability 
NFTs. Uh, let's just call this NFT collection, NFT contract address, cool. And then we'll copy the accountability NFTs smart contract into the first one here. Sorry, into the second one, which is the NFT collection address. And the, the accountability smart contract goes into the accountability contract address here. So now we just have a simple way to access our contracts. And what we can do is we can say export const um, chain is equal to chain ID, which apparently is not getting recognized, dot goeli. Hopefully this pretty, I can figure out what I'm trying to do here. Uh, chain ID. Okay, let's open this up again. Chain ID. I'm trying to import this const uh, enumerable value from the SDK here. So chain ID. Yep, there we go. Okay, so chain ID from the Thorweb SDK, and you can see this is just an enumerable. Uh, if my computer loads, and this is just constant value for Gorillas, the chain ID uh, number five. So we're just exporting these constant values that we're going to use throughout our application. And we can just get rid of the, all of this boilerplate code that we have on the main page here. Let's just say, hello world, save that. And we can run the let's change directory into application again. We'll run yarn dev and we'll open it up at local history thousand. You'll see, we just have a simple page that says hello world with the Thorweb SDK and the Thorweb, uh, the Thorweb TypeScript and React SDK. And if you don't delete all of that boilerplate code, you get this nice little page. We have a connect wallet button and links out to the portal, the dashboard and the templates. Um, so that's why I just got rid of that. I'm just gonna revert that back to say hello world. And the first thing we wanna do, if we go back to our Scala draw, is in our application, we wanted to connect <clears throat> connect the user's wallet and sign the user in with both um, the sign in with Ethereum standard and the sign in with Discord. Now, yeah, do we need to, hmm. That's a good question. I think like, I do actually have a template that has this setup available where we have sign in with Discord and sign in with Ethereum. Let's go to the throw up examples here. And I'm not exactly sure what it's called. I think it's called Discord. Let's just search Discord, see what happens. Discord role granter. This is the one. And apparently the deployment failed, but <laughs> that's okay. Um, inside of API, we have this auth folder here where we have next auth. And we also have pages API. Um, I was expecting to see something else here. Um, okay, I was expecting to see in grant role, maybe that's where we have it. We verify the, okay, so you have sign up with Ethereum in this grant role here. So the first thing we need to do is we're going to import um, next auth, which is going to allow us to, yep, leave that. We're going to allow us to use um, Discord authentication. So it's going to be next auth. Uh, let's just Google next auth and install it. So let's get started. Yarn add next auth into our application folder here. And then add the API route. So let's create in the pages, create an API folder create an auth folder and create a this file name here, except for TS. And what we're gonna do in here is we're just gonna go ahead and copy and paste this file. And this is gonna set up the auth options here and a bunch of other things. But basically it's just setting up this code authentication. And if we look at the readme of this template, it actually walks us through creating a Discord bot. So let's go to Discord developer portal here, click new application, give it a name, click create. So let's go new application. Let's say, um, what do we wanna call it? It's a new application and it's gonna have a bot inside of it. So let's call this accountability project. Clicking create, yep, I agree to the terms of service. Um, so we have our application ID, public key, hopefully those aren't sensitive values and give it a name and click create, add this bot to your 
add a bot to this app. So go to the bot tab. Um, so bots, build a bot, add bot, add a bot to this app. Yes, I would like to do that. And let's say, give your bot a new username and I'm unchecking the public bot field so that only we can invite our bot. So let's say accountability bot. And let's say, uh, where's that public flag that I'm talking about? Public bot is off, so only we can invite it. Scroll down to the bot permissions and give our bot the manage roles, which I don't actually think that I want. I just wanted to read messages. So what do we have here? We have admin, view, audit log, manage service, manage roles, kick, change nickname, read messages. Um, pretty sure that's it. Send messages. That seems like all I want. So he can send Sorry, he can read messages and that's it, right? So save changes, you're ready to invite our bot to our server. Click OAuth2 URL generator on the sidebar, select bot and manage roles and scopes. So OAuth2 URL generator. The scopes generated in by link for your application by picking the scopes and permissions it needs to function, then share the URL to others. Um, what do I need to do here? Select bot and manage roles, so I want bot and read messages, I guess. Read, manage messages, send messages, read message history. Um, pretty sure that's it. So admin, view order log, manage server, manage roles, manage events, send messages, manage messages. Pretty sure that's it, manage, read message history and manage messages. Okay, copy the generated URL and open in the new browser. So what we're gonna do before we do that is I'm going to create a new Discord server. So I'm gonna add a server, create my own, just for me and my friends. Um, let's say accountability server, <laughs> create it. And cool, so we have our own Discord server now. And if we use this link, should be able to open it up and invite the bot to our accountability server so we can create commands in a server, which I don't know if that's necessarily what I wanted. Um, I just want read message history. So hopefully that's fine. Hopefully that's all we need, read messages, um, which is not really a big deal. Read message history, okay, there we go. So confirm that you want grant accountability project the following permissions on account ability server, read message history, authorize it. Oh man, please click each image containing an item that a person normally wears on their feet. Wow, um, yes. Uh, yep, alrighty, that was a weird one. Cool, so our bot is now here, so accountability bot is in the server. And click authorize once you say hi. Say hi to my bot. Hi, follow the instructions. Copy across your client ID and client secret into an environment variables in your project by creating a file at the root of the directory. Alrighty, so in our application file, we're gonna create .env.local and I'm going to set client ID and client secret. We also need to add a redirect URL to application while we're at it. So I'm going to grab my client ID and client secret off screen. So I'm gonna do that over here. So I'm gonna copy, actually, what can you see? I've lost, lost track over here. So I'm gonna copy my, uh, I can't see over there. Let's do it on this page. So client ID and client secret. Oh no, I need two-factor authentication apparently. Um, what have we got here, two-factor for our Discord. Uh, here it is. Excellent. All right, so copy my client's secret across here. All righty, and let's close that file off. Let's bring that back into our frame here. And let's close that, sweet. So we'll go back to our guide here. We also need to add a redirect URL into our application here while we're at it. Um, 
my client's secret is still showing. Excellent, all right, it's gone. So add a redirect and what do we need? HTTP, localhost 3000, um, slash API, slash callback, sorry, slash auth, slash callback, slash discord. Cool. To grant a role to the connected user, we're going to use the Discord API. So this is where it moves into the kind of, um, well, I do need the bot token, but I don't care about the role stuff. So I do need the bot token. So let's go to the bot tab and we need the token. Okay, so I'm gonna create another environment variable called bot token, as it says here, I'll do that off screen. So bot token, and I'm going to grab the thing here. Um, let's grab the bot token. Where is it? Oh, reset token, here we go. Yes, need the two factor again, my goodness. Well, all right, so copy that token across. Make sure I don't leak anything. All right, and then let's get out of that tab. Sweet, okay, so I've got my environment variable set up for the Discord bot, and that's really all we need to do, I think. So to authenticate users, um, we actually need to get the Discord server ID, which can follow this guide. So let's go back to our Discord server and developer mode is enabled. I've already done that. For user ID, right click the username. For server ID, right click the server name. So let's grab, where is our server? Okay, here it is. So server settings, oh, copy ID, there we go. So if we go to our const file, let's just, well, we probably didn't name this the best thing in the world, but let's just say, name it const. Uh, const, <laughs> terrible name, that's okay. Um, and then beneath this, we can say export const discord server ID is equal to this value. Sweet, okay. So then we need to set up the next authentication wrapper. So session provider session and grab these. So let's close that off and we'll open up this in our underscore app.tsx. We're going to set up the session provider and that is going to encapsulate our component. We need to import the session provider from somewhere. Session provider, uh, okay. Doesn't seem too happy with us. Let's go to our pages underscore app.tsx. So session provider comes from next auth slash react. And it's not happy about that. Page props doesn't exist on session. All right. Uh, not sure what that's about, but I think it's fine. Yep, looks good. And then go back to our readme here. All we're doing is next handles the auth flow. We add some additional logic to append the user ID to the information that is available to us so that we can read the inside our API route. Sweet, okay, so now we're set up with the next auth for Discord and we have our bot set up, we have our Discord server set up and we're ready to kind of connect to the Discord here. So there's a component called sign in, looks like. Components, sign in, and we have a sign in with Discord button here. All right, so let's go ahead and copy and paste that into our homepage here. Bam, sign in, which is the function imported from next auth react. So let's grab concession is equal to use session. And what's in this? So we get const. Uh, what do we actually have here? Const data, status. Let's just console log these. Console.log, data and status. 
All right, and then let's run our application at localhost 3000. And we have a connect Discord button over there in the corner and we click it, takes us to the authentication page for Discord. So an external application accountability project wants to access your Discord account. This will allow to view email address, username, blah. All right, so I connect, I have the data, I have my email, my username, and my image here, as well as my user ID. And that user ID gets appended based on the logic that we have here in this um, session. So session.userID is equal to token.userID, and then we return that. So we're kind of just appending information to the uh, stuff that's available to us on the client. So um, that's it. We have Discord authentication. Now we need to... First, what do we need to do? The first thing I'm gonna do is actually connect to our smart contracts. So we can do that using a use contract hook. So we're gonna say const, uh, and we'll destructure a few things. We'll say const use contract, and we'll pass in our const value, which is the accountability contract address, which we'll need to import if this error is out here, import that. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna deconstruct the contract we're gonna say is loading as well. And we'll grab the use contract out of that. So now let's console log contract and is loading. And we'll open up local history thousand again. And uh, we're on the wrong chain here. So we'll go underscore app.tsx. We'll change this from mainnet to Goelli. And now it is loading. Let's just give this a quick refresh here. Is loading is true, contract is undefined, and is loading is false, contract is loaded in. So now we're connected to our contract. You can see the ABI here. We can see we have lock funds, withdraw, um, and all of the mappings and things like that that we um, have on our contract. Sweet. So now we are connected to our contract. We're going to load some information. So if we open up our Solidity contract here, so accountability.sol, we want to load up the um, address. Sorry, we want to load up our mapping here with our address. So we can do that using a const um, use contract read hook. So we're going to say use contract read from the web react. We're going to pass in the contract itself and we're going to call the locked funds function and that's all we need to do. From here, we can grab the data. I believe we can pass the, um, let's just get rid of this for now. No, we can keep that. And we can rename data to be locked funds data and use contract read. I believe we can pass a third parameter here, which is the array of arguments that you wanna pass. So for us, we wanna pass the user's address, which we can get using uh, the use address hook here. So we're gonna say use address, we'll move that up. Whoops, wrong button. We'll move that up one line here. What's the, sorry, I just got off Mac. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out the right one. There we go. So I'll move that up to the top line here and then we can read, use contract read. We'll console log locked funds data here and we're gonna pass the address as the only parameter to that locked funds, which is the key. Um, so if we go to local 3000 here, whoops, um, open this up. So we have console lock funds data is undefined. Argument name, invalid address or ENS name, locked funds address. Hmm. I guess the no, there is a connected address. Okay, so what's going on here? Okay, so lock funds data undefined. But here we have some interesting error messages. Okay, so maybe let's just try and read something a bit more simple without any arguments here. Let's see if we console log just the NFT collection address. Let's see if we can actually read stuff. So lock funds data undefined. Okay, so we can read stuff. So I think we're doing it correctly. We just don't have, um, maybe we don't have the array argument here. We just pass in that. Let's try that. 
Block funds data is undefined. Undefined, undefined, undefined. Is there any errors or anything coming back here? So we'll say is loading. Error. Console log is loading an error. So accountability NFTs requires zero arguments. Oh, we're doing the wrong thing here. Lock funds. But one were provided. Okay, so let's refresh this. Console log loading is true. Loading, 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 loading. Okay, so there we go. Now we're doing it quickly. So there's no array um, as the third argument is just passing in the address as it is without the array. Okay, so now we have lock funds data. We have amount, locked at, and time, and they're all equal to zero. Excellent. All right, so we can display that information on the UI here. Uh, so let's just temporarily get rid of this button. And what we'll do is instead of um, getting rid of all of that boilerplate code, what we could do is let's go to the next TypeScript starter, go to the homepage, and we'll just re-grab that um, boilerplate code and let's just rework it a little bit. So we'll say, um, instead of them being a tags, we just have div, we'll have a div, get rid of the href. We'll do the same thing here, we'll get div, div, and we'll get rid of the href, get rid of href, make it a div, and div. Let's see what we have on the homepage. Sweet, welcome to third web. So let's zoom out a bit, it's going a bit crazy. Uh, the main thing I was interested in was this kind of uh, H1 text, let's say accountability project, just give it a title. And we'll just give it a description here to say, um, let's say, what do we want to say? Um, commit to a goal and lock lock up your funds to ensure you follow through. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. It's pretty threatening, but that's okay. And here we have um, kind of tags where we can display the data. So we can say if is loading. So we can say while we're loading, loading locked funds. While that's true, we'll say loading, loading locked funds. If that's true, and then we'll show a loading state. So we'll say in here, say p loading dot dot dot. If that's false, then we'll open up an empty tag here and we'll render all of these, we'll render that, and then we'll close it off. Cool. Okay, so while it's not loading, uh, we're showing this. If we refresh the page, we should see a loading screen while, uh, we can just get rid of that, it's fine. While the loading state is true, we see this loading text. And once that information has loaded from the smart contract, it comes back. So what we have is if we console.log locked funds data, you can see accountability projects commit to a goal, ensure blah, 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 blah. And this is just a display to kind of say, we'll just change the styles here of the card. It's a card hover. Focus active, we don't need that necessarily anymore. Not sure why I'm having to hard refresh. Uh, excellent, all right, so then what we can display is we have data.amount, so here we could say um, locked funds data.amount, locked funds data dot locked at, and lock funds data dot time. So then time, um, what's time? We could say, these are big numbers, right? So we could say locked funds big number dot from, oh, well, we don't actually don't even need that. Uh, we could say locked at, uh, locked funds data dot locked at dot ah what's a big number we can just wrap it for now to see what it is big number wrap this dot we need to import big number dot from and then dot add the locked funds here so we're going to add locked funds time 
I'm not sure why I keep having to hard refresh. I'm not sure what's going on there, but that's fine. Uh, so this is you locked at this time. So, and then amount locked is that. Sweet, okay. So let's see what we end up with here. Objects are not valid. Okay, so this is gonna to need to be dot two number and dot two number. Let's give it a quick refresh. I don't think this is gonna work either. It's gonna complain about the last one, but let's see. Two errors, can I read properties of undefined amount? Okay. Hmm. Okay. Well, we're passing undefined to this use contract read here. Um, yep, that's a problem. What can we do? Big number dot from add dot to number here. Let's just add this for now. And while that's loading, so it's it's failing because, yeah, it's failing because we're passing undefined as the address. So locked funds data, loading locked funds, an error. So maybe if there's an error, we can display some kind of information here. Hoping we can. So we have the data, we have loading, and the error is null. Once that information comes back, we have an error. Okay, so error. So let's say if error, let's return uh, this container here, div, and then we'll say something went wrong, p, put the error out here, and then we'll add the connect wallet button because that's the problem is we don't have a connect wallet button. So let's give this a quick refresh. The error should come back as true. And then once that does happen, object error. Okay, so what is the error? Error dot message is probably what I want. Uh, error dot reason. Not sure why the hot refresh is not happening here. Let's just redo this, yarn dev. Look at 3000, open it up. So let's refresh this up. Commit to a goal, lock your phones to ensure you follow through. The error should come back since address is undefined. In case something went wrong, invalid address or ENS name, connect your wallet. All right, there we go. So now we've connected our wallets. Let's give this Let's just make TypeScript happy here. Error dot reason. <laughs> what? Error dot reason. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm not sure what's happening in now, but that's fine. It's just a TypeScript problem. Um, all right. And let's set the min width of these to be whatever this is. So how wide is this? 128, it looks like. So min width, min width. Let's just say min width 350 pixels. Uh, refresh that. So we're loading and amount locked is zero. You locked at and the time is time you can unlock. So rather than number, I believe this should be, uh, let's say if this is equal to zero equals um, well, locked at dot, let's make this a big number, big number dot from, locked at dot EQ zero. And let's say if it is zero, then we'll say whatever GitHub Copilot is recommending here. Close that off. So if it's zero, you haven't staked yet. Sorry, you haven't locked yet. Otherwise, create a new date times 1,002 local date string. Okay, that looks good. Um, 
same thing here is big number dot from if that equals zero time you can unlock and a new date big number dot from dot add log four to number times a thousand to local date string sweet all right let's get rid of these arrows all right excellent cool so we can say if it's loading then um, there should hopefully be some indicator um, as to, well, there's a few states that we can be in, right? Where if the time that we've transformed is greater than now, then we want to show this. So it's like, there's a state where one, well, the zero state is kind of, Zero state, well, let's say zero error, something went wrong. Um, one, loading, waiting for data to load, but we kind of already handled that within the application. So one is hasn't staked, oh, sorry, I keep saying staked, hasn't locked, well, hasn't connected wallet yet. This should actually be zero. So this should be one and zero should be hasn't connected wallet yet. So if there's no address, and we just want you to connect your wallet. So if not address, then we'll return this kind of same thing. Return this and we'll say accountability now, accountability project, sorry. Um, accountability project, connect your wallet. That looks good. And this should be just in a div that's like class name connect wallet. Close that off. I believe we actually have a uh, wallets or connect, so it's called dot connect. Styles dot connect. So if there's not an address, so if you open this up in incognito here, whoa, that looks a bit strange, doesn't it? Um, let's add styles dot main. Styles dot main. Close the main in both of them. Let's close main here and close main here. So let's open that in incognito. Accountability project and a connect wallet button. Okay, so in the connect, let's add a margin top, one rim. Um, and let's give that, oh, that looks good. I think I'm happy with that. Let's give it a quick refresh, see what it looks like. Maybe let's make that a little bigger, two rim. So you connect your wallet and then you'll reach this state um, error something went wrong. This shouldn't really ever happen if the wallet is connected now. And then two, we have a state where we've loaded the data. Um, so we'll say maybe well, we can have a loading state. So loading, waiting for data. Let's return this. So if loading locked funds, then we can say return this thing here, accountability project. And we'll just say P loading and we don't need to connect wallet button anymore. So we're loading, let's refresh. So we get accountability project, we see the connect wallet button, we load. And now we're in a state where we actually don't even need this ternary operator anymore since loading is never true. And then we can say three, the data has loaded, there is no locked funds. So here we show the user the option to commit X funds for Y time. And the fourth kind of state is data has loaded, there is locked funds. And here, we could have a ternary operator that depends on if the if the funds are ready to withdraw. If they are, then show a withdraw button. Otherwise, show the information about the lock funds. So that's kind of where we are in this one. Um, so what we could do is say, this is the state where you have locked funds. So what we could do is a ternary operator that says, um, 
we want lock funds data dot amount is greater than zero. That's actually not what I care about. Um, lock funds data dot. Hmm, what do we care about? So is the data ready to be withdrawn based on the date? So it's like locked funds data dot time locked at and locked for, which is not actually what it's called. Uh, so, so we have locked at and time. So locked at, so we're gonna say big number dot from locked funds data dot locked at dot add big number from locked funds data dot time dot larger than the date dot now. That's a good question. What is that though? Let's console log these. So say console.log date can unlock. Um, big number dot from this. And current date, big number from date dot now. So let's console log that. See if we have anything useful here. So date can unlock is well, zero. Current date is, oh, that's not that helpful. Um, dot two number. Okay, that might be more helpful when we actually do it. So data has loaded and there's no locked funds. So this is what we're currently at. So we're gonna say if locked funds data dot amount is equal zero, then we can return this div and main stuff again. We'll copy the H1 in, close all of these things off, and close the return off, close the if statement off. So that's where we're at now. So calendability project, and we want to have um, a form that allows users to lock funds for X amount of time. So for now, we're just gonna say, whoops, P, hello world. So let's hopefully, we should hit this kind of third state. So we're loading, data is there, and we hit the spot where locked funds dot amount uh, is equal to zero. Sweet. So we're ready to kind of create this form now. So instead of hello world here, let's create an input form where you have one field for the amount of money that you wanna lock up and one field for the amount of days that you wanna to commit to, all right? So there's two input fields. Um, and we could probably do this using a form, but I wanna use the web three button component. So I don't actually think we need a form. We can just use stateful variables to say um, const form, set form equals use state. We'll have an object here, amount and days. is equal to empty string. <clears throat> and we'll import use state here. And then in this kind of form area, we'll have um, a, all we need is really just input, uh, type text placeholder amount to commit. And on change here, we're gonna say e set form, rest of the form and update the amount. And then we'll have another input. Yeah, so we'll say input, type text, placeholder, days to commit, on change, set form, form, e dot blah, 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 looks good. And this is gonna be, instead of text, it's gonna be number, number. And if we refresh here, 
It looks pretty terrible, but we can add some styling. So let's go module.css here. We'll say uh, dot input. And we'll say, yeah, it looks good, whatever. We'll just use that as a placeholder. Uh, input class name equals styles dot input. Copy paste this. And then we'll probably have like a form as a div. So dot form. And this will be a div that has a class name of form. Close the kind of make form here. Um, this is gonna be display flex column center, just by center. We'll have a gap of one rem, sounds good. And if we refresh, that's <laughs> a little big. Uh, let's say like, I don't know, min width, um, min width 420 pixels. I don't know why I keep having to refresh here, but it's okay. The gap is like a bit big. We'll have margin top. We'll have 16 pixels. The gap, let's just say like, uh, actually, is it a gap or is it the margin that's the issue? Uh, there's a bit of a margin. So maybe we don't even need the gap. Margin top, let's say 32 pixels. Go to quick refresh. And we'll maybe up the font size a bit. Font size. 1.25, 1 1.2 rem. Okay, that looks decent. Um, beneath that, what we're gonna do is we're gonna say web3 button. And here we're gonna connect to, the first thing we need is contract address. Here we're gonna connect to accountability contracts. So pass in that address, the action, we can access the contract and we'll, uh, let's just console log contract for now, keep it simple. And that's really it. So we have one three button and the action we want to do when we click this button is update the, um, what do we want to do? That's a good question. So if we bring this smart contract, we actually want to lock funds. So we want to call lock funds. So within this, we're going to say contract.call lock funds. So that's the name of the function over here in the smart contract. Then the arguments that we want is the amount of time. So that's going to be uh, whatever we called this. Uh, so form.days, which is uh, a little gross, but let's say form dot days. Um, we need some kind of formula to like convert this into the amount of days. So 86, 400, I'm assuming that's how many minutes are in a day or in a, how many seconds are in a day. Let's just quickly check that. How many seconds in a day? 86,400. Uh, we don't need the brackets here. So form dot days. Um, this should just be number, so it should just be zero. Days zero. Uh, form dot days times eighty six thousand four hundred, and the final parameter we want is the value. And I'm pretty sure that's how you do that. So let's double check portal uh, EVM SDK calling contract functions. If you go to JavaScript here, you can see in the value, we can pass the amount. So let's go ethers.utils.pass ether. So value is gonna be ethers.utils.pass eth. And this is going to be uh, form.amount. And we'll need to import ethers here. Cool. All right, so send, we don't need that comment. That looks good. Um, on success here, on success, let's say just alert uh, success, on error, alert error, and that looks good. All right, so days, 
e.target.value. Um, how can I convert this to a number? I just wrap it. Yep. And then this is a string. That looks good. So, okay. So then we commit to a certain amount of time. So if I say, I'm not sure why I keep needing to refresh this, but it's okay. Um, oh, we need some text for the button. So this is going to say lock funds. Excellent. All right, so amount to commit. Let's see how much I actually have in this wallet. Uh, 0 0.137. So let's say 0 0.000000001 days to commit. Let's just say one. Lock up the funds. And we are locking zero Goeli ETH. Not really sure if that's correct. I feel like it should show 0.0. .0 Maybe we did too little here. Error. Let's just say 0 0.001. Make it not too small. And this should say 0 0.001. Okay, great. So that's the amount we're transferring to the lock funds function. And we're committing to one day. So we're passing in 86,400 as the lock funds here. And that's the timestamp that's going to be used. So that kind of makes sense. But I guess for kind of testing purposes, let's just temporarily set this value to be 100 rather than the full day. So we'll just wait 100 seconds or maybe like I don't know, 150 gives a little bit of time to play around. So we lock funds 150 seconds and we commit 0 0.01 Goeli ETH. So let's confirm that transaction goes through. This locked funds data should be refreshed and we should hit this state when that transaction goes through. So the transaction will go through, the query will be rerun since that um, cache kind of gets invalidated or that query gets invalidated. And then we should hit this state where the lock funds data dots uh, locked out or whatever is, sorry, we should hit the state where lock funds data dot amount is not equal to zero. So we skip past this and the transaction has just gone through. So success. And then we do reach the state, but we get invalid big number value, argument value. Values undefined. I'm not really sure what happened here. Let's just refresh. Connect our wallet. We're loading. Invalid big number value. Locked funds data. Dot locked at. Huh. Okay. Um, if. Huh. What is happening here? So at this point, what do we have? Console.log locked funds data. Let's just see what we're working with. Connect our wallets. We're working with lock funds data dot. Oh, locked four is not a real thing. Okay, so locked four. That is not real. We have time. So locked funds data dot time. Pretty sure that's the only reference we have. What am I doing here? Uh, let's just get rid of that and see what we're working with now. So we connect our wallet. We're loading, loading, loading. Okay, so amount locked is this should be ethers.utils.formats eth. Pass that in. So I'll close this off format that value you locked at 31st of October 743, which was two minutes ago. The time you can unlock is the same time, which looks incorrect here. The time you can unlock. Huh. That should be like two minutes later, but it's not. Locked funds dot time. Hmm. 
Yeah, that's weird. Let's give it a quick refresh. You can unlock at 743. So this is just going to be 0.001 ETH. You locked at 743, which is big number from locked at two number times 1000, <clears throat> which is correct. This is big number from locked funds data locked at plus locked funds data dot time times 1000. Not sure what's happening here. Let's just console log these values. So console.log time available is this value and console.log time locked is this value. So I'm not sure why they're not different here, but let's see. So we refresh our wallet connects, time locked. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah, what happened here? Time you can unlock. Oh, that's the day after. Okay, sorry, I didn't. I don't know how I didn't see that. So, did we not <laughs> update it? I thought we did. From eighty six thousand. Yeah, what happened here? Um. Okay. Well, that's not good. But not really sure what happened here. Um. So, where's our Web3 button here? Web3 button. Yeah, it should have been form days times 150. Not really sure what happened here. Um, okay, what I'll do is I'll go to a different wallet here. Connect my wallet. Hopefully I have girly funds in here. Nope, I do not. Okay, go early faucet. Oh my goodness. Okay, let's try this on. Switch to Goelli. Nope. Okay. Um, that's not good. What about this one? Let's switch accounts. Let's connect. Uh, connect. Okay, so we're in a different wallet here. What should have happened is I commit for 150 seconds. So form.days times 150 should be 150 seconds. So... Um, Amount to commit, days to commit. So let's say 0 0.0001, days to commit, one. So I should be committing for 150 seconds. 0 0.01, <clears throat> this parameter here is the time that I'm locking. So 150 seconds. Doesn't make sense why that's, yeah, looks fine. Okay, so let's approve it and what should happen is now that we've got the UI sorted, when this transaction goes through, the state should reflect that on the UI. So we should reach this state and we should see all these console logs. Um, and then I should be staked for 150 seconds. So it should be like two and a half minutes rather than a full day. So I'm not really sure what happened there. So success goes through, we reach the state. Excellent. Okay. So I think it was just a problem of refreshing, but now we can unlock two and a half minutes later. So we locked at exactly 750. We can then unlock on the same day, two and a half minutes later, and we'll be able to unlock um, this kind of this amount. Um, so now the last kind of thing we need is the button to request to um, unlock 
the data. So we have amount locked, you can lock at, time you can unlock. And beneath this, we'll say if the, um, if the date, if the time is available now, show the withdraw button, which is not what I want, but big number from lock funds data locked at add lock funds data dot time. So gets the time they can unlock uh, larger than big number from date. Uh, yep, that looks good. And if that's true, then we can show the button, but otherwise we'll say P uh, you're not ready to withdraw yet. Come back on, oh, I don't need that. I'm just gonna say you're not ready to withdraw. Close that P tag, but in here is where the true state comes in. And within this, we're gonna add another Web3 button. Um, I think we wrapped our other one in like a little, oh no, it looks good. So we're gonna have Web3 button that contract address is equal to the accountability contract, withdraw, and close that Web3 button. And the action of this is going to be just calling a function that we're going to write called attempt withdraw. So this is just complaining about some stupid shit. Attempt withdraw and that function, if we get rid of all of these comments and stuff here, let's close these UI states. Let's just add a TS ignore here. At TS dash ignore. And all these UI states are closed. Now we need to actually handle the, <clears throat> there's actually one more thing we need to handle in the UI here and that's the user needs to sign in with Discord before they can see this button. So there's one more ternary here. We can say the user needs to sign in with Discord before this button appears. So let's say based on the hook that we have, uh, in the left window here, we have data and status. So let's say, uh, I'm not really sure what status is. Authenticated, loading, unauthenticated, okay. Um, and data. So let's just say, let's rename these to be something more meaningful. Uh, data can be discord auth data. Status can be discord auth status. <clears throat> and we'll operate on, we'll just operate on discord auth status equals authenticated. And then you can see this. Um, oh, that's tough. Uh, this is gonna be a question mark. So if it's true, so if it's not true, then we'll see this. Otherwise run this logic. So let's just say P hello world. In there, okay, so here we can replace P hello world with a button. Uh, I'm not sure if we have any styles for a nice button yet, but we can add one. Um, let's say button, on click, sign in Discord, sign in with Discord. Attempt to withdraw, and let's just add dummy function up here to say um, async function, attempt to withdraw console.log, just so that's happy. Excellent, okay. Um, all right, that looks good. And maybe let's just add like a nice little button component here. Let's just say main button, uh, background color, linear gradient. Uh, let's give it a nice like, I don't know, <laughs> blue, yeah. And then border none, color white, padding, blah, 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 blah. Font size 16, sure. Sounds good. And let's smack that class name on here. Stars.main button. And then since it is now 755, if we refresh, we'll see the, oh man, um, underflow. Not really sure what that means. Underflow. Huh. Um.
multiply by 1000. Hopefully that's happy. Unexpected div. Um, what the fuck is happening here? Big number dot from add multiply. Hmm. Yep. Missing a bracket here. Okay, sweet. All right, there we go. So now we can see the withdraw button and that just console logs, blah, 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 blah. But what we want to do is within this function first, well, am I authenticated with the Discord? I'm not sure that I am. Let's just clear all these like caches or cookies. Okay, so it seems to be like some next auth cookies happening. So if I empty them and I connect my wallet, I now see the sign in with Discord button, uh, which has no styling for some reason. Styles.main button. Don't know why I have to keep refreshing. It's pretty annoying. Sign in with Discord. Why does that not work? Invalid property value. Huh. <laughs> What's wrong with that? Background color. Oh, it needs to be background, right? <laughs> Looks terrible. Uh, needs some border radius. Eight pixels, sure, whatever. I don't know why I'm bothering with the styling, but let's just see. Sign in with Discord, excellent. Okay, so I sign in. That needs some like background, sure. Transition. 0 0.3 seconds, um, cursor, pointer, pointer, pointer. Let's go back, see what it looks like. What is that transition, Jesus? Sign in with Discord, I'll click it. Access your username, blah, 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 blah. Sweet, we come back. We load it again, and now we see the withdraw button. So we're authenticated with Discord. And now we are ready to write this attempt withdraw function. So the first thing we need to do is sign in with Ethereum. So we're gonna sign in with our wallet, and we'll prove our identity on the back end. And we then send an API request to the back end to check our eligibility to withdraw. Let's close these off to withdraw. And if we are, then we'll receive a signature. If we're not, we'll receive an error. And we can use signature to mint the NFT. So, First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna sign in with Ethereum. And if we take a look at our trusty template back here, can actually see this in action already. So if we go to index.tsx, you'll notice when we request to grant the role, the first thing we're doing is defining uh, the domain here. So we're gonna say domain is equal to example.com. This can just be localhost 3000, for example. But you can you can pretty much give it to whatever you want. I'm just going to keep it as example.com. Um, and the SDK we're going to access is Hans SDK is equal to use SDK. And that grabs us an instance of the Thorweb SDK on the current network. We request um, the user to log in, so they're going to sign a message. When they do, we'll store the result of that message signature in the login payload variable here. And what we do with that is we make an API request to an API route that we're going to create. So we're gonna send an API request to the backend to check our eligibility to withdraw. So we're gonna try request the API. In our case, it's not gonna be grant role. It's going to be um, 
attempt withdrawal, or just withdraw, I guess, keep it simple. And as part of that request, we pass the login payload uh, in the body of the request. And we're gonna verify that login payload on the server side to kind of prove this user owns this wallet address. So we have a state where the user has proven their identity of Discord and proven their identity of this wallet as well. So we can kind of act in a way where we know the user that we're currently interacting with is the Discord user and is this currently connected wallet. Um, sweet, so. Uh, what we can do now is go to the API folder and create this API, right? So we're gonna say withdraw.ts and hopefully Copilot helps me out here. This is a TypeScript Next.js API route. Uh, import stuff first, so import next API request. Um, and then that's what I wanted, sweet, thank you very much. Export default async withdraw, async function withdraw. Cool, all right, uh, assign error function variable. I don't know what that's talking about. Sweet, so when making a request to your API slash withdraw, <clears throat> my computer's frozen completely. Uh, all right, pretty is doing its thing, just give it a minute. Not sure why it takes so long to format the file, but that's just me. All right, now it's happy, sweet. So we send the login payload to this API route. Now, if we take a look at the template API route here, go to API, we'll go to grant role. The first thing that we do is we deconstruct the login payload out of the request. So we're gonna say first, let's get rid of this pointless comment up the top here. We deconstruct login payload out of the request body. And now we can verify the, um, user who signed that message actually owns this wallet address because this login payload, uh, once we run it through this verify function here, we'll be able to tell if the user actually owns this wallet address if the signature is valid. Um, and that's what we're gonna be doing. So we're first in this function, we're going to use unstable get server session from next auth. Hopefully it's not called that by the time you watch this video in the future, but that's what it's called on the current version of next auth, um, unstable get server session, which gets the currently uh, authenticated user with Discord session, if there is one, and we can access it in the server side here. So we're gonna pass in the request, the res and the auth options here. So let's copy this code over. So we're gonna say const session is equal to await unstable get server session and auth options is imported from the configuration file that we set up here. So this export const auth options where we define discord, use the environment variables that we set up uh, or that I set up off, off screen. And then all of these configuration options are exported from this file here. So we're just gonna import them and use them within this unstable get server session function here. Uh, if there's not a session, <clears throat> then I don't know how you reach this API route, you're not logged in, you're not allowed to continue. If they are then not authenticated, we'll also return this. We're gonna say if there's not a verified wallet address, which will validate by using the SDK. So we're gonna initialize the SDK, or the third web SDK. Let's import that and initialize it on the Goeli test network for us. And we'll use the same domain that we used in this function here, so example.com. And maybe let's export that to the const variables here. So export const domain name equals example.com. And let's change that to const verify wallet address is verify the uh, domain name and the login payload. So we're passing the login payload, which is the results of the user signing the message into the auth verify. And essentially what we're doing here, if we read this function, is a server side function to verify the address of the logged in client side wallet by validating the provided client side login request. So we're essentially providing the um, signature that comes back from the user signing the message and we're sending it into this SDK to be verified to actually say, okay, this is actually valid. This isn't just some made up 
crap that the user passed along with the request. And then once that is verified, we have this verified wallet address or we uh, actually error out, I believe here. So I think we need to write this in a try catch block. So we're gonna say const verified address and we're gonna say let verified wallet address equals string or undefined. Try assign that to this. If it errors out, then we're gonna say um, invalid login payload and return. And we can just return that actually, return res.status401 error invalid payload. Okay, so, um, and now we don't need this. Sweet. All right, so we've initialized the SDK, we verify the wallet address. So now we've verified that they're authenticated with Discord. We've verified that they've signed in with their Ethereum wallet and they own this current wallet address um, that they've sent along as part of this payload as part of the API request. So we're in a state where we know the user is signed in with Ethereum and we know that signed in with Discord. What we can do now is utilize the Discord API to say, did this user send, um, did this user send a message to the Discord server uh, once a day or multiple times a day for the amount of days that they've committed for? Um, so the first thing we need to do is find out how many days the user committed for and then what we can do is ask the question to the Discord API, how many, um, how many did the user uh, send a message to the server every 24 hours for the amount of days they committed for? That's quite a long, comments. So did the user send a message to the server every 24 hours for the days they committed for? If they did, then generate a mint signature for them and return it. If they did not, then return an error, I guess. Uh, return an error saying you failed. <laughs> All right. So first thing we need to do is find out how many days the user committed for. And the first thing we do here is to get the actual contract. So we're going to say const accountability contract is equal to SDK dot, uh, await SDK dot get contract pass in the accountability contract address here. And then we say const dates committed, it's await accountability contract dot call. And we can take a look at our thing here. It's the, sorry about that, my camera just died, but we got the backup webcam. But what I was saying is the value that we're looking for is this locked funds mapping. Um, and we care about, oh, I guess we don't know how many days. No, we kind of do. It's, yeah. We can divide the time by 86,400 to get the amount of days they committed for. It's kind of hacky and gross, but I think that's the way we do it. Um, so we get locked funds. Locked funds, second parameter is the user's wallet address, which we have now in this verified wallet address. Um, So just to make sure TypeScript's happy here, I'm gonna say if there's no verified wallet address, then return uh, that 401 response here. So then verified wallet address now is always a string, is never undefined, and we grab that from the smart contract. So now we have days committed, but reality is this is actually locked funds, locked funds value for user. That's a pretty bad name, but that's what it is. And the time they've committed, the amount of days, and the amount of days they've committed is the locked funds dot uh, time divided by 86,400 seconds in a day. So days committed is equal to lock funds value for user dot time divided by, which let's say there's a big number, so big number dot from this value dot uh, import big number here. 
import big number here dot divided by um, big number dot from 86,400 and that looks good. Now calculate the amount of money to withdraw. We already know that, whoops. We already know that. Um, I don't really care about that actually. I just care about the amount of days they've committed for. So ask the question to the Discord API. Did the user send a message to the server? So step one is grab the, uh, yeah, we do need to do that. Um, but I think that's available in session, so that's fine. Grab the messages the user has sent to the server. So messages equal wait, fetch, Discord API, V9, guild, server ID, messages, search, author ID, session.user.id. <clears throat> Not quite sure that's right. What do we have as part of the session? So session, 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 session. So we have user ID out of the session. So session.user ID and Discord server ID comes from the const value here. This is complaining because it doesn't think it exists, but I'm pretty sure it does. So I'm just gonna ignore that. So we fetch it as part of the body or headers or whatever. We provide the Discord bot token. That's correct. And that's it actually. So const messages that. And yeah, now we have access to all of the user's messages. I'm not sure what the time frame is here. Maybe let's actually um, look this up. So Discord API get user messages to server. Um, I want, oh man, these are ugly. Uh, so guilds, guild, and then messages. Messages, messages, messages. Man, there's a lot of shit happening here. Um, get guild. Get guild messages. Man, I don't even know if that's a real thing. Uh, we'll see, I guess. Get guild. Is there really no like, uh, Alrighty, uh, get guild messages, Discord API. <sighs> Discord developer portal, how to get text of the guild. Okay, whatever, let's just see if it's a real thing. If they did, let's just console.log messages here. Okay, so let's see if this actually does anything on our app here. So we'll go to local 3000, give it a quick refresh. Should be able to withdraw on this account. So let's click withdraw. It asks us to sign in as a first step. Let's sign that. Then we should see in our server, we get 401 from where? Well, all right then. Um, <laughs> Can I, what happened here? 401 unauthorized. Is the bot unauthorized? Oh, it actually is. I think that's what happened. So the bot, Discord bot token, I'm just gonna check what I called it on my environment variables here. I actually called it bot token, so it's not the right name. So instead of Discord bot token, this is just bot token. And let's run this again. So withdraw. Example.com wants you to sign in, yep. Then, bots cannot use this endpoint. Well, that's a problem. <laughs> ha, huh. code 20,001. Twenty 
20,001. Opcodes and status codes. Bots cannot use this endpoint. Fuck, why not? Um, messages. Messages, guild, messages. Oh my goodness, guild, messages. Uh, guild, guild, slash. Oh my goodness, okay, this is not looking too good. Search guild members. It's not what I'm doing though. What is the endpoint that I'm trying to reach? Um, let's search for Discord. Nope. Well, all right. Um, Discord server ID. I'm not sure how to get this information from the API. Get guild channels. <sighs> Returns a list of guild channel objects does not include threads. Hmm, all right. So if we get the channels. Can I access messages here? Message count. Get channel messages. Yes. All right. Yep. So here we go. Returns the message for a channel. If we're operating on a guild channel, this endpoint requires a view channel. If the current user is missing it. All right, well, so the first thing we need to do is get the channels. Okay, so rather than messages. Yeah, rather than, so let's say channels is equal to const channels is equal to await fetch. Um, basically this with some modifications. So Discord API guilds, guild ID slash channels. Send the bot token again. It's the wrong name. Change this from that to this. Let's get rid of messages and let's console.log channels. Hopefully I can actually see this information. Withdraw, sign in. And our server, hopefully we get, there we go. Okay, very nice. So we have a list of channels. So, um, general. I don't know. What is happening here? And we can see. Okay, so text channel is let's rename this to be something like more obvious. Send messages here. Save changes. And then let's rerun it. Hopefully it comes out with the send messages here. Oh, I already did it. Okay, so send messages here. So this is the ID we're after. Um, let's put that in the const. Uh, so const export const channel ID. Let's equal to this. Yep. 
and then get the messages for that channel, which we can do by doing this. So um, const messages equals await fetch. Please ignore channels dot find. <laughs> uh, maybe let's do this out here. So I was going to say const channel I want uh, channel uh, message now. Correct channel equals channels dot find channel and we'll find channel dot id equals discord channel id and this channel yeah, let's just say any for now, it doesn't really matter. And then what we'll do is we'll fetch TS ignore correct channel ID dot messages, pass our bot token here, then resolve it as JSON. And then what we can do is console log messages here. So if we run this, <clears throat> what we should see is the message is printed out for that specific channel. And there's only one message, which is me saying hi. So I'm hoping to see that. Okay, so we have an array of messages. The author is me. Um, accountability bot. Doesn't really show the content, does it? Uh, I guess it just gives you an ID and you can look up the content if you really care about it. Cool, all right, that looks good. <clears throat> so now I have the messages of the channel. Um, I don't know what the scope of this is. Like, does it get every single message by default? Pretty sure it wouldn't do that. Returns an array of messages, objects on success. The before, after a round are mutually exclusive. Only one may be passed at a time. All right, there's probably a better way to do this, but I think this works for now. And then what we can do with this is, so on the session, we have the user's ID. We can filter this user's messages. So let's say const filtered messages is equal to messages dot filter author dot id. Yep, is equal to session dot user id. And pretty sure that's it, session dot, let's just double check our template, session dot c. Really? Session. That's what I thought. Session user ID. Yep. Let's just grab that from the session up here so we only have to TS ignore once. Uh, const session user ID is equal to session. And then session dot user ID. And be user ID. Then we have an array of messages sent by the currently connected Discord user. Okay, so when that is done, if they did, they generate a mid signature and return it to them. If they did not, then return an error saying you failed. Okay, so. I also need the time that the user sent the message. I'm hoping that's part of it. Timestamp, what the fuck is that? Timestamp, yup, okay. That's an interesting time format. I don't know what that is. I'm hoping Copilot knows what it is. Um, check, check. If the user sent a message, yep. The message dot 
timestamp is in the format. Yep. Oh man, all right. Um, I don't think that's what I want. I don't care about sorting it. We need to convert this to a Unix timestamp. So um, filtered mess, uh, let's say const did send message daily. Filtered message dot every. I don't know what that does. Uh, what's it gonna do here? Every, if index equals zero, return true. What? Oh my goodness. Yep, whatever. <laughs> I don't know what this does. Um... Every, what the heck does that do? Test whether all elements in the array pass the test implemented by the provided function. It returns a Boolean value. Okay, so every message has to pass this check. If index is equal to zero, return true. Previous message timestamp equals new date filtered messages. The previous index dot timestamp dot get time divided by a thousand. Const current message timestamp equals new date. That's wrong. It should be less than that, right? Less than 86,400. The difference in time needs to be... <laughs> the difference in time needs to be greater than... 86,400. So you sent one, well, each message you sent was more than a day apart, which is not really the best way to check. Let's say you had to send them <laughs> every eight, well, at least eight hours apart, right? So you can send it like, yeah, that makes sense. So you had to send them, each message is eight hours apart is what this, this is checking right now. And the amount of messages that you sent needs to be at least the amount of days that you committed to. So if you did, so if you did send message daily and you sent You sent, well, days committed and messages dot length, well, filtered messages, sorry, dot length is greater than or equal to days committed. There we go. That's a start. I don't know if it's perfect, but it's a start. So then generate a signature and we can use the docs here. So it's a portal, uh, EVM SDK, advanced features, signature based minting. And we need to connect to our NFT collection contracts. So we're going to say const NFT collection equals await SDK dot get contract. Um, NFT collection, NFT contract address, pass the second argument, which is NFT collection, kinda, not really, I'm not gonna pass that. And then what I wanna do is say const signature equals await NFT collection dot ERC721 dot signature dot generate. Um, and here's where we get to specify the information. So 
generate. Yeah, I don't think I'm on the right page here. Um, on ESC 721, signature based minting. Okay, so here's what I want. Uh, generate this kind of payload object here. So we're gonna have metadata. So for the metadata, well, let's just copy and paste this and see what we can um, modify. Paste this in. Generate an object containing all these things and why does it not like us okay what is happening um i don't know what's happening <laughs> all right well let's just forget about that Metadata, we can pass in a name. Let's give it like session.user.name. Let's make this a string to say session.user.name. NFT. Um, for committing to Days committed of accountability. So that's the metadata. Image can just be like, mm, I don't know, <laughs> what is this URL that it's pointing? It's nothing. Okay. Um, let's just say what we can do is we can upload directly from the CLI. Say so CDC, third web repos. CD official, two-way demo assets, CD shapes, CD images. What we can do is MPX the web latest, upload gold uh, yellow star.png. This will upload our file to IPFS and give us a link. So now we have this link available here. Let's copy paste this. Bam, paste the IPFS in on signature. And then what else can we put in here? So quantity is just gonna be one. I don't think we need to specify that. The two is going to be verified wallet address. So only that wallet address can use this mint signature to claim the NFT. All right, so then return res status to 100 signature. If they did not, then 401, you failed, something like that. You failed to commit. Sorry. Okay, so there we go. Um, this should fail if we test it. Might not fail. Uh, since I have sent one message, I sent it at 534 um, p.m. It is now 839 p.m. So by our logic, the, well, it will return true. So it did send message daily, will return true. This logic is like pretty bad but it's like good enough. It's not really the main priority of the kind of build. This is like pretty far from <laughs> acceptable. Yeah, it's not great, but I'm okay with it. Um, so I will, I will actually pass and I should get a signature back, which is pretty interesting. Um, so I, I'm signing with Discord. I see the withdraw button. If I click this, I'll be asked to sign in. I sign in. Everything happens on the back end here. And what happens is no signer available. My goodness. Oh, I know why. So we actually need... This needs to come from the... 
well. A wallet address that has mint permissions needs to generate the signatures. And the way that we've initialized the SDK is from a read-only perspective. So if we go to the docs, we can see setting up the application, we have this read-only connection here. And we actually need from a private key. So I'm gonna change this to be const SDK is equal to throw away SDK from private key. And we need to put our private key here. Now, it's kind of a disclaimer here where I'm going to be using environment variables. I would not recommend you to use environment variables. It is not secure to store your private key in environment variables. You need to be very, very careful with your private key. Anybody who has this value can completely access and control your wallet. So what I would recommend is you read this page that we have available on how to securely store your private key. I'm using a burner wallet in this video with no funds, so I'm going to be using environment variables. I recommend if you care about the funds in your wallet, use this method to securely store your private key using a tool like Google Cloud Secrets Manager or any of the available tools on this page. Um, and yeah, that's what I would recommend. But in this video, I'm just gonna keep it simple and export my private key and put it in an environment variable. So I'm gonna do that off screen. So I'm going to export my wallet's private key. I'm going to paste that into an environment variable. And I just realized I exported the wrong one. Cool, so I'm gonna export that. I'm going to go to .env.local and add an environment variable for my private key. Paste that in. Close it off and I'll switch back to my wallet address here. Excellent. All right. So now uh, where it says your private key here, I'm going to use process.env.private key as string. Excellent. All right. So now we have our private key initialized or the SDK initialized with our private key. And when it goes to generate this um, mint signature, it's going to come from on behalf of our wallet using the private key instantiation of the SDK. So if we go to localhost 3000 now, and you refresh, we'll probably have to kill <coughs> the server here just to reload our local um, environment variables. If we kill the server and we restart it up, Let's see here, we can now click withdraw and it shouldn't even say withdraw actually. It's gonna, I'm gonna change that to say like mint NFT, mint NFT, because you're not actually withdrawing the funds at this point. You're actually just getting the NFT back that allows you to withdraw funds from the contract. So I'm gonna say mint NFT, example.com wants you to sign it to your account. I'm gonna sign it. And it died. Okay, so what went wrong? Contract, oh, we initialized it on Goeli, I think, as a mistake here. On Mumbai, sorry. So this should be Goeli. Let's restart this. Mint the NFT. Example.com wants you to sign it to your account. Yep. And now it should be generating the signature for us. And we're gonna console log that here if that does go through. Excellent, check the console for the response. And we have the signature here containing the payload and all of the information. So you can see the metadata here uh, for committing to uh, zero days of accountability. And that doesn't quite match up with what I was hoping. Um, well. console.log locked funds of value for user. Yeah, I'm not sure why it's a zero. That's obviously something wrong in this logic here. So let's test it out again. Just refresh because I'm pretty sure I didn't. So mint NFT and we'll see on the server here what is locked funds value for user dot time is equal to 96. Oh. Um, 
Um, Ninety six. The fuck does that mean? Oh, I guess I actually did commit to zero days on this account. Um, so that does actually make sense. I'm not sure what that is in like real number, big number, uh, hexadecimal, two decimal. I think it's just 96, right? Like, um, am I stupid? Hex number. 150, okay, so it's not 96. Um, so this actually makes sense because 150 divided by 86,000 is obviously not going to be uh, bigger than zero. Um, but in a real case where we have rather than 150 here, yeah, we would have 86,400. And then this would be one at least, right? So you would commit for at least one day. Just for our testing purposes, we kept it simple, uh, 150 seconds. Sweet. So we get the signature back, and that means we can actually use that signature to mint the NFT. So we can say, um, if if response, well, if not response, okay. Let's just say alert. Um, we need to actually destructure the JSON anyway. So we're going to say const data is await response.json alert data.error return. Otherwise, then we can continue. We can, we can mint the NFT. So we're going to say const transaction is equal to, well, we need to connect to our contract first. So I'm going to connect const contract NFT collection equal to use contract pass in the nft contract address here and then we're going to say nft collection um nft collection dot erc 721 dot signature dot mint and if we take a look at our api slash withdraw we return data dot signature. So it's going to be data.signature. And that's it, actually. Um, so const tx is equal to the awaited result of that. Await that. And when that succeeds, we're going to say alert, minted NFT successfully. You can now well, maybe we can actually just straight up call it uh, directly after. And then we can rename this to be like mint, um, mint NFT and withdraw funds. So when that transaction is done, now we can call the withdraw function. So what we're going to do is going to say const withdraw transactions will wait contract dot call. And we can open up our accountability soul file here. Contract.call withdraw. This doesn't have any parameters. So we can just call withdraw. And that's it. All right. We're going to say wait for that's not what we need to do. Um, we can then say, so let's say like alert uh, minted NFT successfully. And then we go. And try and withdraw. So alert withdrawn successfully, withdrew successfully, and we'll console log each of these transactions. So say console.log tx, copy this, console log withdraw tx. And that actually should be it, right? I hope this works. Let's see, local history thousand. Make sure I'm on the right wallet here. Wallet number two. So I locked 0.001 ETH, it locked it at 7.50. Time out unlock is about an hour ago. So I can mint NFT and withdraw funds. So what I'll do is I'll first sign in. I will then have all of this logic run on the server in the API slash withdraw. The signature will get generated. It will return that to the client and then we'll call this 
index.tsx function here where we say utilize that signature to mint the NFT. Once that transaction goes through, we'll say mint NFT successfully. So here we're minting the NFT. Let's go ahead and confirm this. Then we, when that transaction goes through, the withdraw transaction on our accountability smart contract will be called. And we can actually take a look at the dashboard to see our NFT being minted. So let's copy this address, open that up in the dashboard here. Just while that transaction is being mined in the background, we can go to the NFTs tab. When the transaction goes through on localhost, wherever it is, when this transaction goes through for minting the NFT, we'll be able to see it. So minted NFT successfully. We will now be able to see it in the NFTs tab here. I'll just give it a quick uh, kick. Go to the NFTs tab, go to accountability NFTs. Um, I was hoping to see my NFT here. Uh, <laughs> Not sure where it is, but yep, okay, it's not there. Then the step, why is it not there? Okay, so it's loading. There we go. There we go. Okay, so Jared's NFT, we have our NFT minted and into the NFTs tab here. We have the media that we uploaded to IPFS using the CLI. We have Jared's NFT. We have for committing to zero days of accountability. I was not very accountable. And then the local 3000 again, after that transaction goes through, we're asked to withdraw funds from the smart contracts. So this means we've passed these three checks here. We have a balance of greater than zero. And we're now running this transfer and setting our funds to be zero. Excellent. All right, so let's go ahead and confirm this and we should have 0 0.01 funds sent back to us. So let's confirm this transaction. And if we take a look at our balance here, we'll see we have 0 0.08 and when this transaction goes through, I'm hoping we have uh, 0 0.09 or somewhere between 0 0.08 and 0 0.9 after we pay for the gas of the transaction. Let's see. Okay, so it went down to 0 0.07 here. But when that transaction goes through, what we should see is our balance, hopefully, goes up. Let's go to Goelly Scan. Check it out. Let's see. Let's paste our wallet address in here. What we should see is we withdrew. So we withdrew funds from here and we transferred 0 0.01 Ether from the smart contract address to our OX, uh, whatever our wallet address is here. So we have OXFAB and that is our wallet address. And we can see ERC20 token transactions, internal transactions. Okay, here we go. So 43 seconds ago from the smart contract to our wallet address value of 0 0.01 ether. I think we must have lost uh, some funds in the gas transaction there. But as you can see on Etherscan, we have withdrawn our funds and now our UI reverts back to the state where we haven't had any funds locked up and we're ready to send uh, our next commitment to the smart contract. So that's it for today's build. Hope you enjoyed hacking this project along together. And if you did make it this far, a very big congratulations to you. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun hacking the project together with all of these awesome features like signing with Ethereum, linking with the Web2 world with Discord authentication, using the Next.js API routes and Next Auth combined to create this kind of uh, community built NFT collection where users can mint specific NFTs into the collection using the Thoweb SDK as well as proving their identity in that server side environment. So a lot of complex and fun features that we've implemented in the application. So I hope you did enjoy that kind of showcase of what you can do within the Web3 world. If you did, uh, remember you can access the full source code in the description, but if you wanna see more content like this, remember to subscribe to the channel if you choose to do so and like the video if you did get any value out of, out of the video. It does help me out a lot in getting this video recommended to other people like yourself. So thank you very much. If you do do that, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.